One final night of sleep and it was back on the road the next morning. From Lynn Lake to the point where you hit the actual winter roads is about 50 kilometers. Honestly, it's 50 kilometers of tight, winding road that is definitely not for the faint of heart. But it's the only way to get to the winter roads. We came this far, there's no turning back now. We are a little bit concerned. We have heard conflicting reports. We have heard anywhere from 10 to 100 hours that's gonna take us to make this trip. Now on the worst side of the scale, we do have the provisions to last for three days. We have food, we have water, we have heating supplies, we have sleeping bags, we have a ton of fuel on our vehicles. We also have two saddle tanks in the back of my saddle truck. Phone. Saddle phone. Sa sa satellite phone, exactly. As far as I'm concerned, there's absolutely nothing that can go wrong now. And with those words in mind, let's make the trip. Let's go. Once we started rolling north on the winter road, it didn't take long for us to start seeing empty tanker trucks rolling south. It was comforting to see traffic, but almost right away you get a sense of just how rough this road really is. We've only been on this road for about 10 minutes, and I've already come to the determination that it's one of the worst roads I've ever been on. It is rough. You're up, you're down, you're left, you're right. It's narrow, it's tight. Holy man. I can tell this is going to be one hell of a long and tedious journey. It's not bad though, we only got about 14 hours and 50 minutes left. These roads are unforgiving, and it didn't take long to find a broken down vehicle. These dudes were heading to Lac Brochet, but their truck had different ideas. Like any good old boy, I figured I'd pull over and lend them a hand. And a thumbnail in this case. <laughs> the first wound of the day. There were endless reasons to stop on this trip. Scenery abound. But this was one thing that I wish we had not found. I got no problem with legal hunting, but whoever did this was in it for specific parts. Such a complete waste. J-Man, being the hunter that he is, was devastated by what we had found. I'm looking at a pretty heavy duty slaughter here of a bunch of animals. I'm looking at about nine dead ones right now. I, you know what, I'm speechless. This is kind of disgusting, it's terrible, it's sad. Just for their antlers, that's it. So all these people wanted out of these. The caribou are key to the people of Tadouli Lake and is really one of the main reasons why they ended up moving here. There are spots here where you could go a lot faster than 40 kilometers an hour, you know, it gets nice and smooth. It feels actually like as good as the, the road I live on at, back home, but the problem is that then out of nowhere, there's like a huge dip or something that will just like bust that differential right out of the back of your truck if you hit it at 50 or 60 kilometers an hour. Basically, this is a roller coaster that we're on. It's exactly what it feels like. It's like there's a whole carnival uh, atmosphere to this entire experience. It's roller coaster slash bumper car. And I'll tell you, all this road food we've been eating, you know, all we've been eating is like subs from gas stations and whatever. And then you're just uh, up, down, up, down. I pounded back a Red Bull to kind of give me a little bit of wings earlier in the day. And now it's like, uh, just up and down and up and down. I don't mind the roller coaster, but usually you're not on it for 10 hours. <laughs> this is a pretty cool trip. Like, it, you know, it, it uh, you're basically trail riding for the entire day. So if you like, this kind of stuff. If you like just, you know, bogging along and doing whatever, really, I mean, this is it, man. Like, you, you know, you can go, you can drive for days like this. It's, it's fun. Holy crap already. If you recall, several hours ago, which feels like about two days ago, I was bragging about how much fun this is, and it's just, oh, it's like off-roading, and I'm up in Seddon's Corner, and I'm having such a good time. Holy man, those feelings are gone now. That must have been the Red Bull I drank in Loon Lake talking, because now I am just tired. I've had enough of this road. I have never driven at 20 kilometers an hour for this many consecutive hours in my entire life. Just gives you a total indication of just entirely how isolated this place that we're headed to is. I've almost uh, murdered uh, Jay at least four times already on this trip. Break 32, can you hear me good there? Not really, no. I got lots of cackling and crackling. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Something you're doing over there is come with this. Yeah, I can't hear you. I'm getting pissed off, shut up. I hope when he does finally get a chance to watch this, 
that he realizes just how close he has actually come to death on this trip on a number of occasions. Uh, but now he seems to have calmed down a little bit, so it uh, looks like uh, he's back in the groove again. The real lesson learned here is it, it, it takes complete and total concentration. Like you take your eyes off the road for one second, you know, to grab a little bite to eat or you start fishing around looking for something, and that'll be the second when you hit some drop off that just makes the suspension of the vehicle smash. It feels like the dashboard's gonna fall off on your lap. So basically you just gotta pay very close attention to what's going on and you gotta keep a real steady, slow speed. Absolutely nothing gained by going fast. Like if I were to just try and hammer it through here, something would break, man. Like that you would break suspension parts or you know, you, you, something would bust for sure. I don't know what vehicle could really hammer through here, but I mean, obviously you wouldn't want to do that anyways for safety reasons, but I just think like from an emergency perspective, I guess like the, really an airplane or a helicopter is really the, the only way in and out. Cause I mean, you can pull it, you can drive an ambulance down here or anything like that. I'm pretty sure there's not too many four wheel drive ambulances. Maybe they have one out here. I guess the RCMP, you know, if they had to respond quick or whatever, I mean, man, there's no fast way in or out of here. Like, that's it. Help is a long way away. By the time we pulled into Tadouli Lake, the town was feeling a little bit shut down. I got to admit, it took us a lot longer than we expected. The next morning, the town sprang to life. And it was a bright, blue, sunny day. Our first stop was the local school. We decided right from the start, we were going to be coming bearing gifts. How's everybody today? Good. You're wondering what these guys are doing all the way out here? I don't know. Well, well, I'll tell you. My my first, my friend Jay is going to tell you about your road that we came into. That was an amazing experience. You know what? I've been driving down roads for the last 20, 25 years of my life, and I have never traveled a road like this that I came up on before today. It was absolutely amazing. It took 15 <laughs> hours to get here, but you know what? I don't care. The reason why we did this trip is because I, I'm, what's, I'm what's called a Métis guy, okay? And so is he. So where we come from, we are, uh, we are mixed First Nations people and European people. And in the early 1900s, my granny, my granny, she was born in 1907. She told our story so many times of how far they had to go just to go and get a little bit of supplies, you know, on a sleigh with horses and the whole bit. And we thought to ourselves, at that time, it was hard for them. There were some places they didn't want us to go across their land. They, they, they wouldn't allow us, so we had to go around a river that went all the way through and wound through. We could have went straight like the crow flies, but instead we had to go in this river because they didn't want us to cross over their property. So I always thought in my mind nowadays, you can go as far as you possibly want to go. No one can stop you now. So that's our goal. There's nothing stopping you. If a couple of dummies like us can come here and be in front of a TV camera, that's, what I wanted, that's the point that I want to try and make to you guys. So uh, again, thank you very much for having us down here. And uh, we brought along some stuff with us. We asked uh, Chief Jimmy what, uh, what kind of things that he would want. His first concern, he wasn't concerned for himself at all. He thought of you guys, OK? He thought, what could we, what could we bring here for the kids, right? So what we brought you guys, we brought the party in the back of our truck, OK? When you guys have a school dance from now on, this is a mirror ball that's going to hang, and this light here is going to shine on it, and it's going to make this whole place look like the best party you've ever seen. Now, we have a fog machine, too, that you put in, and you get to fog the whole bit. So hopefully, when you guys have a, have a nice school dance in that, that you'll always remember are your friends that came all the way from Buffalo Point all the way up to here to bring this stuff to you guys. So we thank you very much just for, I'm not going to talk to you all day, but just thank you very much for the opportunity to come down and meet you guys. Give a round of applause. Thank okay. All right, thanks, guys. After hanging out with the kids, Chief Thrasi of the CSA Diné First Nation told me the story of his people and what a story it was. So, uh, Jimmy, I got to tell you, man, that was quite the uh, trip journey, you know, for us to get up here. But uh, you sure won't uh, hear us complaining because I understand that uh, for you guys to get here was a heck of a lot more of a journey, eh? Yes. So why don't you tell me about it? Well, uh, back in the early 50s, the, uh, uh, the federal government and the uh, North Northwest uh, company closed down, and also the uh, uh, conservation officers had had uh, did uh, some kind of uh, coverage on the community caribou. They were saying the caribou were in decline, and uh, First Nation people, our people, the Sisin, then had been not being conservative, and they were killing off caribou. Yeah. And what they didn't know that was uh, our people for thousands of years have have, have uh, come across to this uh, caribou crossing 
they, they kill off as much caribou as they could before the snowfall. And then that was a freezer at, uh, along the shore. Oh, yeah. So during the winter, they come back to the same spot and using a stick to find out where the caribou was. Yeah. And they put that stick underneath the snow. And that story broke out in, the, uh, 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 I don't know, across Canada, I guess. And, and that started the whole movement of people get, moving the people out of uh, Duck Lake and put the people in the shores of uh, Churchill. Chief Therasi told me the heartbreaking story of how his people were taken by the government and shipped off of their traditional hunting grounds all the way over to Churchill. Sent to live there without adequate materials, most of the CSA Diné people would spend the next year or more living in tents. The toll it was taken on the culture and even the physical well-being of these people was too much to take. Something had to be done in order to save their lives. Luckily, there were still enough elders left who were willing to stand up and take action. Led by then Chief Peter Yassi, a small group set out to find a new place, closer to their homeland, where they could celebrate their culture, teach the young people the ways of their own, and make a better life. Playing the drum is a thing that came back to the people, and also the hand games. The hand games are used today also they do play hand games with the elders or they com compete. So a lot of that when, you're, when your people were in Churchill was being lost then? It was pretty well losing. They were yeah. losing it yeah. and it was because there was too much drinking and the cultural side of things. Yeah. Were, there was no caribou there or anything to, to rely on. So the elders at that time were fed up with it. They said they were going back. So you basically watched it from nothing to what we have now? Yeah. So when you first came here, there was a lot of travel on with, uh, with dogs then too? Yes, I, I, uh, I had a dog team at that time. I used to, I, five dogs. I, I brought five puppies with me. I brought them up, I trained them. And when the skiroos came around, uh, they, they found them useless in the water. It's, uh, it so was did a lot that change, faster. Did that change your, uh, your life when a skidoo yeah, arrived? Yeah, it did. It sure did. It, uh, it, Do you remember the first one you had? Yeah. The first skidoo, what was it? It was a 12-horse Elan. Oh, really? Like yeah. the, the big one. So what year would that have been around? That was in probably in uh, 70, uh, 77, 78. Did it last for a long time? Uh, no, because I wasn't quite familiar how to fix it. Yeah, yeah. So again, I just can't thank you enough for sharing the story. And uh... Uh, Thank you for coming up here. Really appreciate it. After talking with the kids in the community, the chief really wanted me to head out on the lake and get a taste of what life is like hunting and trapping. I left Jay behind to explore town while I went off in search of adventure. With my guides, Jojo Therasi, Raymond Powderhorn, and Peter Duck, I joined in on a very small Yamaha Bravo snowmobile that I borrowed. As it turned out, the snowmobile was the least of my worries. It was the story of a monster living in the lake that had me most worried. So, um, what lake are we on right now? Uh, Tadouli. And tell me, <coughs> he said there's something living in Tadouli Lake. Yeah. What have you heard about it since you were a kid? Something big. A big kill of a fish or something. What do they think? What, you said maybe what it's like an alligator or yeah. it could be anything, eh? So when was the last time someone saw it? Just this summer. Yeah? So what, is, what do they see when they see it? Like the water just moves huge or what? Something black. Yeah? Scary. I don't want to run into that. You think we'll be okay in winter or what? Oh yeah. It's gonna come busting through the ice and get us right now. Or oh, no. <laughs> how long has it like? How long has it been going on where people talked about it? Like since you were born, even before that? Early seventies. Yeah. That's the move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Early seventies. Yeah. 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 That's they okay. were saying yeah. then some people's my fishing nets would go missing. Yeah? yeah. Does it have a name? No. No. No, no one ever named it. Nobody the Tadouli. The Tadouli monster. Well, Tadouli monster. Yeah. yeah. While I was out hunting with the boys, I left Jay the keys to the Suburban so he could go out and explore. I wonder what kind of trouble he managed to get himself into. Well, here I am, out here in beautiful Tadouli Lake. Willie's out hunting right now. And look what I happened to come across here. Willie's gonna be so jealous that I found this. I have no idea what this is, but it just looks super cool. But hey, looking inside here, Truck cargo, three quarter ton, four by four. M37 Canadian, CDN. I'm assuming that means Canadian. Uh, what else we find here? Manufactured by Chrysler Corporation of Canada in Windsor, Ontario. On the 12th month of 1951. So that makes this a 1952 four by four. This thing's so cool. There's a Manitoba Wildlife Federation sticker in here. 
and also a, uh, a, a number, like a government number on the dash here. So that's leading me to believe this was once a Manitoba Elf Federation vehicle that's probably traveled up and down these roads that we took in last night. For like probably a thousand times it's made it and it's still sitting here. It's got, it looks in mint shape, like for the age of it is. Looks like it's got 61,000 miles on it, which uh, that's pretty good for uh, such a vehicle like this, I'm assuming. Other than that, I really don't know much more about it, other than the fact that Willie's going to be pretty upset that he missed this. Uh, yeah, this is excellent. I wonder what else I can find around here. The boys tried their best to find some caribou. It looked like we were getting skunked. Although I was saddened that we didn't find any caribou, I was still more than happy spending the day out on the lake. A very unique part of being in Tadouli Lake is behind me here you have the generator system which is running the entire town. There's no hydro lines that come up here, nothing. So that's why it's so important for the trucks to come up here in the, in the winter time. They have to fill all these tanks so these people can have hydro and heat year round. Is it a good idea to have a full-time road up here? And then this will all change. People will come up here, they'll come hunting up here all the time, they'll come camping. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be totally different because it's only 350 kilometers north of Lynn Lake which is technically only a three and a half hour drive on a decent highway, unlike the winter road, right? So that winter road kind of maybe keeps it like this. I think if you don't have this winter road, it's not gonna, it won't retain its beautiful picturesque. It won't, it'll, it'll change. Too many people will come through here. It'll, I don't think it'd be good for the environment. Too much stuff would come up here that doesn't need to come up here. You know, we get so caught up building cars, trucks, and motorcycles, that sometimes we forget the true reason for them. It's not the vehicle itself, but it's where it takes you in the end that really matters. Sometimes it may just be for a Sunday night cruise, maybe it's to a national hot rod event, and sometimes it's somewhere you didn't even know you were going. The journey started out as a way for me to prove to everyone and myself that unlike in my grandmother's days, we can all go wherever we want and take whatever route we want. And while I think we did that, sometimes the universe helps steer us in a direction we never saw coming. Spending the day out on the lake with Jojo and the boys made me realize this whole drive up here. All the places, all the people, it was all helping speed me along to finding out who I am. At the end of our day of hunting, the boys invited me back any time to go out and fish or hunt with them again. I realized that I'd arrived at my true destination. It isn't often in a man's life he finds himself at the end of the road, still surrounded by friends and totally enlightened. But here I was, a true gearhead, remembering that where our vehicles take us is just as important as what the vehicles are and who we are. I would never trade this drive for anything. For the first time in my life, I finally traveled so far that I found myself. My only question is, where to next?